The difference is. Oh, whoa. Whoa. Oh, wow. That's really crazy. Wow, wow. We holy moly guacamole. I can hear myself. Yeah. We don't usually hear ourselves, do we? No. That well, hold on. You listen to yourself all the time on so videos. So, actually, first confession. Okay. This is a show about confessions, you know. <laughs> it's called Talking Chimps Confessions. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. So, I did not re-listen to the podcast that we did. Mm. Because I just have always done that with all my videos I've done, anything I do on Instagram or social media, I just do it. And it's a bit of a Gary V thing, like rather than like go, is that perfect or did I sound weird or do I not like that? Just put it out there and move on. Mm. And so you sent me a message saying, um, let me know if you want me to like chop up Mm -mm. the thing. And there's part of me that did, but I was like, I actually don't want to go back and listen to it. What's the hesitation? Would you over criticize yourself? Yeah, I think get in that, your head. Yeah, I think I would judge myself for like, oh, why did I say that, or why did I say it like that? But I also trust that I just said what I said at the time, based on how I was feeling, my beliefs at that time, all of that. But I think that's a moment in time, and then you go back and you're like, oh, like that, or oh, that sounded weird, or that sounded corny, or that sounded whatever. Mm. As someone who is has to at some point, you, you, you have to spend, naturally, if you edit your own things until you get an editor, uh, you spend hundreds of hours, maybe thousands of hours with the amount of stuff I put out over years, looking at yourself, listening to yourself. Yeah. So you get sick of yourself, <laughs> right? You can get, but I think there's, like I've learned about myself that way as well. Like I've learned, you see the little mannerisms, like, damn it, I said, I'm um, like seven times there. Yeah. Well, like Tim Ferriss has picked up his own things. Do you remember? Yeah, so I was listening to that and he's like, oh, these are my like my go-to. What did he call them? Like ticks or mm. your, yeah, that you're always like every time there's a pause, it's like a hey or an um or a mm. And he's like, I did that so many times in one episode. Mm. So I know that I should, but I just haven't. <laughs> It's like if you want to go there because you know you'll find things. Yeah, of course. But I think it's valuable. I think it, like if you're acknowledging that, all right, I'm here to observe myself as well. Mm. And, uh, you know, otherwise, how do you really know? You never really know what you sound like, what you what you look like, yeah. how you're being possibly perceived. Yeah. So I think it's part of my own journey that I need to go back and listen to it and just not be judgmental and just. But is it okay to judge yourself as well? I think there's the acceptance that if it's just things like, oh, how I sound or um, I think there's like the critique that could be really helpful. Like if I am saying um and are or Mm. I said something that I wasn't super clear, I could think about, oh, I could have said that better. I think there's like that sort of stuff that would be helpful. I I definitely find that a lot with myself. And uh, one thing that I've... uh, I do when I teach classes and I'll, I'll actually watch things back so I can clip it and put it out there mm. is that I'll use pauses a lot. For my, my students will make fun of me because I'll like ask a question or I'll say something and I'll just pause. <laughs> like a like, pregnant pause. Or, or, or awkward silence. Right, but it comes so often. I do it on purpose because yeah. I want to give, you know when you're in a classroom setting, university setting, whatever setting where people uh, are teaching you something and they ask you a question or you want to say something but you feel like there's a, what do you call that? Like a self-judgment or it's a anxiousness. You want to ask something, but you don't. Yeah. You don't say the thing you really want to say. Ask the thing because you, you. Yeah, so you just wait there. <laughs> right. You like freeze and you're fearful of judgment or looking whatever, silly, stupid, whatever. And so I've noticed off, if I give enough time and I'm only like sometimes like 10, 20 seconds, I'll just walk around, take a sip of water, you know. Eventually, sometimes they'll jump in, yeah, and they'll ask the question because it's like it's almost like the space sometimes gives them permission to go in. Mm. I was listening to someone else recently, and they were talking about that, like where you ask someone a question and they they give their answer, but then intentionally to give them more space because usually people will expand on it. Right. Because if you just jump in, oh, okay. they might have like 
like wanted to say more, but they've kind of given you, oh, this is the summary. But if you give them a bit more space and they might go, oh, and, and this and this. It's like, yeah, a good thing to remember. Like right now. And now you start thinking about like the conversations <laughs> we're having right this moment. You overthink it. Yeah. But that's a great point because, and that's a good friend of mine kind of highlighted that to me uh, who's been on the podcast and talking about that exact point is that the art, it's an art of conversation. And I think what's, I said it a couple of times before, but it was so valuable. I know it was weird for people to put these headphones on. Obviously I'm used to it, but what's so valuable, why I'd really recommend it for you or if anyone wants to start a podcast, even if you're doing it remotely, blocks out outside sound mm -hmm. and you are locked into your conversation really like nothing else. Yeah. It's like we're in a tunnel. Right. <laughs> and, and like we're paying attention to each other. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful thing because even if you go out to hang out with friends or family, there's always distractions or other people chiming in. You put these on and it's like for one, two, three hours, it's going to sound a bit strange, but you almost become one. You become like this symbiotic, like uh, a really good conversation is like, I don't know, going down a river, um, trying to avoid all the rocks. I just made that up. So poetic. You know, um, you know what they call me in the streets, <laughs> the poet. But recently, mm. like this conversation makes me think about recently, I went to this workshop and we were guided through all these def different techniques and one of them was active listening. And it doesn't sound like anything fancy, but it was literally asking someone a question and then letting them tell their answer and as the person that was doing the active listening, we weren't able to add any commentary. We weren't able to add any like, oh yeah, like I understand that or I've felt that. Acknowledgement. Or, yeah, or acknowledgement or even like, you know, when someone's telling you something, you're like, oh yeah, I've been through that as well. So right. you're, you're adding in like your bits. But essentially as an active listener, we just had to sit there, listen, kind of open body language. We could do like the head nods or the smiles or the something to say, yes, I'm hearing you and I'm listening to you. But to just purely give someone an opportunity to speak. And it was such a nice reminder of, oh, yeah, like we often just chime in like little bits. And there's times where you want the back and forth mm -hmm. and you want the banter. Mm -hmm. But when someone's maybe diving in, like to something deeply, they're sharing something vulnerably or personally or then to actually give them the space. And it was quite, you know, like vulnerable being the person sharing because it was like, okay, someone's like seeing me and just mm. giving me this space. But it was also nice to go, oh, I can actually, I am just sharing and they're giving me the space to share. So it was both powerful but also vulnerable as well. Mm. I want to make sure I'm actively listening right now and giving you <laughs> space to speak again if you need to. I know it's it's funny because then you start to overthink <laughs> yeah, it because then you want you do want like the back and forth and there's right. definitely times that you want that. But um, oh. it was a nice reminder when someone's like really vulnerably sharing to just yeah let them share. It's often that you find people are you listening or are you waiting for your turn to speak? And I, I catch, I catch myself. Oh, I don't, actually don't have it. I usually bring a notepad or here to write down just little thoughts and, and questions that pop up because that's the great thing about a podcast is that it allows you that format to go back and forth like that. And um, obviously forgot it, but yeah, are you, are you, are you waiting for your turn to speak? I think it's a big, it's one of the most common mistakes we make through conversation and one of the big, that's what I was going to, that's what it made me think of what you were saying. You, know, you listen to an interview or a podcast or some conversation with, 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 with someone you want to listen to. And one of the biggest things that annoy me is when the interviewer will ask a question, a different question, another question, and they're just going for the sound bite. The person responds, there is no acknowledgement or like they said something beautiful and something really profound. And it's like, oh, go pull that string, go mm. further. And they go to the next question and they ask another question that's completely different. There's no listening. It's just questions, mm. answer, question, answer. And I, it's the, one of the most ugliest forms of conversations that I hate. And there's one thing that actually uh, pushed me to do this mm. is because I hated, see, I think conversations and podcasts can be done so much better. And I hated seeing 
that type of uh, just yuck conversation. What's well, like an an interview, but not a conversation. Exactly. It's like, okay, can you answer this? Can sure. you answer this? Can you answer this? Uh, yeah. But th- even you can see some interviews can be like, I think maybe the best interviews are like conversations in some ways or, or, or actually because we're both speaking here. Like I'm the, I'm the guy, I'm the host, right? But I'm giving myself permission to talk because I don't want to make this like an interview. Yeah. I never want to make it like an interview. Uh, I want to make it like a conversation except for people like, you know, sometimes you get bigger guests on and you have a lot of questions and you will make it more like that type of format. So you, you auto regulate it, but that's it. That's it. That's all I got. Okay. I have a few things I really want to share. I would love to hear them. You messaged me. You said you did. Yeah. Please start sharing. All right. And I'll do um, some active listening. All right. You can do some active with listening. Some, with some interrupting. But yeah, but, I'll, but feel free to chime in because okay. I, I feel like that's where more things come out. Um, yeah, as soon as you messaged me, I was like, oh, yeah, I would totally love to do this. And a big part of why I was like, well, of course, I like hanging out and we chat and it's just a free flow. Mm. Um, but also thinking about from when we last did the podcast – to now, like so many things, yeah, have shifted and, and changed. So I thought it would be cool mm. because, yeah, just lifestyle and where I live and, yeah, and then some experiences have changed. And one of the – there's been many things, but one of the big things that has created some change or at least started to create ripples of change, I had been wanting to do ayahuasca for about five years or so. It's really strange. I promise you. I don't know how I was feeling something. It was going somewhere like that. That's really interesting. Oh, that, wow. <laughs> that, that was almost wow. like you, you hear that music. Whoa. <laughs> my, I know you guys can hear that. that that's my 4 p.m. third meal alarm, a.k.a. the ayahuasca alert alarm. Wow. That's so cool. Wow. <laughs> right on cue. You know, you know what we do? <laughs> no! Please, oh, no. no. That's the wrong one. I clicked the wrong <laughs> button. My bad. <laughs> right here. Anytime you want to get crazy, the sound effects. You just tell me which one to click and we'll click them. Okay. What's the love heart one? <laughs> so that's the one you do ayahuasca to? Yeah. <laughs> so you let me know and we can go there. Okay. Cool. All right. So, sorry. That's totally fine. It's not my fault. Yeah. It's my fault. Um, yeah, so... When was this? So it happened, I did it a couple, maybe three months ago now. Um, and I'd been wanting to do it for about five or so years. I've, like, watched all the documentaries, listened to all the podcasts. Every person that I know that I've come in contact with that's done it, I always ask them questions and was just really curious about it and knew that I wanted to do it, but it was... I knew it was like a timing thing and that it just had to feel right. So before I left Melbourne, I had an opportunity to do it, but I'd just come out of a relationship, was processing all of that, and I don't think I was in the right headspace to go and dive into like a psychedelic experience that is, you know, some people consider is like 10 years of therapy in one session. Mm. So then I was like, okay, it's not right. And then anyway, fast forward, moved to... Byron or close to Byron, live closer to Lennox Head and surrounding myself, well, I've met lots of people that are really like-minded. Everyone lives a very healthy, conscious life. They explore, you know, psychedelic substances, but a lot of people just live a really healthy life. Everyone's out in nature, really conscious of what they eat and just very similar to me. And one of my good friends said, oh, I've just been on this ayahuasca experience and I know you want to do it. I feel like this feels like a really safe place. The lady who runs it was um, really nurturing and provided a space that I felt really safe and I think you would really connect with it. And she already knew that I wanted to do it and I, and I really trust her. And so she put me in contact with this lady. There's no advertising for ayahuasca, so it's all through email and kind of code language and it's called meditation on email. <laughs> and wow, that's, so they're that conscious of like, you know, because obviously people yeah. can track emails. Yeah. Huh. So, yeah, she put me in contact. And as the person that refers, you also have to be willing to, yes, you'll be a support to this person when they go through the experience. Do you think they're like mentally ready to go through this experience? 
So she sort of had to vouch for me as well, which oh. is a big thing. And then, you know, then they send you all these videos to watch just to, to again make sure, like, are you ready to, to dive into this experience? Um, and everything was telling me, yes, I was nervous and excited. And for me, that's like the sweet spot, nervous, excited. It's out of my comfort zone a little, but it, I know I really want to do it. Mm. And that's how I feel with like most things. If, I, if I'm in that kind of place, then it's usually what feels right. Um, so I got to the, the day of the ayahuasca ceremony and I was super nervous and I kind of rocked up and I, I got there and I, we had to, not we had to, there was an option to sleep outside so you could bring yourself a tent or something or you could sleep in the, the ceremony space. It was like a 24-hour a experience but like there was a ceremony overnight um, and me being already a bit nervous about it and just ha- liking the idea of having my own space, I brought a, a swag. And so I walked in and I almost think I was a bit rude, not intentionally, but I was a bit nervous and just wanted to like get set up and get settled so then I could relax. And I walked in and was like, oh, are you Laura? Um, you know, where do I set up my tent? And ba- like I barely probably even said, you know, hi, how are you? I think I might have, but I think I was just a bit nervous and and they're like oh just you know go set out your tent outside and so I settled that up and like kind of settled my stuff and was like okay I'm here and it's all gonna be okay um and once I did all that then people started rocking up and you start to chat to people and it was a really beautiful experience just beforehand because there was all these people that have done ayahuasca before and they're like, oh, have you done it? And I said, no. And they're like, oh, you'll you'll be okay. And they kind of talked you through some of their experiences and almost like wanted to hold your hand and be like, okay, like you're in a, a safe space and, you know, you never know what's going to come up. But, you know, here you are and almost like well done for like getting to this stage of like putting yourself into experience an experience where anything could come up, which could be, you know, good, bad all the things in between. Um, And then we get to the stage of like opening the ceremony and that was with like a sharing circle. So we literally went around the circle and it was like, um, what's your intention for being here and like what do you want to get out of um, yeah, this ceremony? And so we're going around the circle and even just sitting there, I was like, I'm so nervous, even just to share in front of people like why I'm here and you know, some people were being really vulnerable and saying like, you know, I am really nervous about being here and, you know, even just talking makes me feel really nervous and it got to me and I was literally like my heart was beating and sweating and, and you know, I shared and I, I just said, you know, I'm, I'm here, I've been wanting to do this for about five years and I just really want to um, kind of unlock anything that's holding me back in any areas of my life and I you know I want to receive those messages so whatever it is like whatever is like kind of blocking me from moving forward I I want to yeah be open to receiving those messages and and I didn't share too much more but it, even after that I was like oh I can relax now I've like you know I've started the process of just like being here and and then everyone went around the circle and some people were crying already because it was you know, they were there to heal different things. Um, and then we had a little bit of an intermission and then they started the ceremony and they did all these, the the shaman, a female shaman. Um, she had then four other guides that were there to like help and support the ceremony. Um, and Can she, I pause for a second? Yeah, go. What time is it? So when we did the first part, the sharing circle, maybe that was about six o'clock. Is the sun still out? Yeah, so it's still light at um, about 6 p.m. And then did the sharing. Then we had a little bit of a break and then they started after dark. Where is this exactly? Or so, approximately? Yeah, in yeah. I gotcha. <laughs> in, in Byron, Byron vicinity. Beach, nature. Inland? Nature. So, so inland. yeah, just slightly inland. And we're on someone's big, massive property. And we're, it's not even a temple. They kind of refer to it as like the temple space. But literally it, it was this lady's house and she'd cleared out her living room and we're all seated on the ground. So you're indoors. Yeah, indoors. But, yeah, sort of, you know, you look outside and it's just green everywhere. But we were, are inside, yeah. Um, okay. 
And some people are on cushions, some people on meditation seats and all of that. All right. Thank you. I just wanted the setting. Yeah. And then so we're all sitting around kind of in a circle and then there's the shaman in, at like the front in the middle and then either side of her there's, yeah, there's four other guides. So we're kind of like they're kind of sitting in front and we're kind of sitting almost like in a semicircle okay. around. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so they did this like traditional kind of acknowledgement of this plant medicine of the ayahuasca and like thank you to the spirits and thank you to mama ayahuasca and just did all this stuff that was really beautiful it was like acknowledging that this is like a powerful experience and thank you and and all of that and then it was sort of like the guidelines of how this is all going to work you know we're in in darkness and you know sometimes you might not be able to walk to the bathroom you may need to crawl to the bathroom Everyone has a bucket because some people will be purging and throwing up. Some people will cry. Some people sweat. Some people cough or hiccup or yawn. Like there's usually some sort of cathartic response. Did you come into it faster? Did you think about that? Yes. They do tell you to, um, for the week beforehand, it's like not have spicy food or coffee or alcohol. Um, it's not fully fasted. It was to have just a light breakfast and then so by the time you've done the ceremony you've got not too much food in your something like light breakfast and if you want to have a small snack but then you know we're now six or like seven eight o'clock at night and you haven't eaten maybe since like morning or um just before lunchtime okay so good. not completely fasted um yeah, and they said you can also, like, you can put your hand up or call out for help whenever you need to. Um, and then it was also talking about the, the medicine. It was like, you know, the first round they give everyone one cup. You come up and you, you have the, the cup and you kind of do your own, like, intention or, like, gratitude message or whatever you want to do. It's, like, silent in your head. And then, then you go and sit down and then you can have a second cup and I'm sitting there going, how do you know if you need a second cup or not? Mm. And so I put my hand up and said, you know, like, what's your guidelines? Like, if you've never done it before or, like, what's the guidelines? And she said, if you're in your head and you're thinking, should I have another cup? Yeah. Then you have another cup. <laughs> and it. I was like, okay, that's really clear to me. I got it. After how long, though? So, What's the metabolism of this compound? I don't know exactly, but I think part of it is, like, she's going to give everyone – a cup mm -hmm. and then after that so any time after that so there were 17 people so it took a bit of time to go around so maybe it took at least half an hour to like um to go around and so then after that if you wanted another cup then you would like go up for a second cup and so we'd done one round and i'm sitting there and i'm not really feeling anything um i kind of waited a, a little bit and I'm like, no, nah, I'm questioning this, so I need to go up and get my second How cup. long did you wait? So there was like the – maybe it was been like 45 minutes from like when I first sure. – Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was feeling a little bit. I started to see some visuals and my first – like moving away from the microphone, <laughs> like veering over here. Um, I did start to see some visuals at this stage and it's quite – um, it's going to sound quite dark, but I saw these three. Pause. You took your second cup. No, so sorry. Just before the f the second cup, I did start to see a few things. Okay. okay please. Yeah, um, what did you see? I saw these three black women, and they had their throats slit, and I was like, "Well, that's pretty intense." And how vivid is this? Like this is pretty clear, like almost like a, a picture in front of my so eyes. This, and my how eyes different would it be from a dream? So your eyes are closed. Dream. How different would that be from a dream? Can, can you compare it, it? This was so vivid, like it literally, I, like I saw it. Almost like real life? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and this is before I'm fully feeling the effects as well. It was almost like just the start of it. Um, and as I saw this, like the message that I felt was like, I in some way, shape or form need to be a voice for people that don't have a voice. And I was like, Oh, that's a pretty strong message. 
Um, and it's not like the message comes through as like a, a voice or anything. It was like I saw the visual and that's what like popped up. But it was I was still pretty conscious at this stage. So it was kind of seeing it and that was my interpretation. Then the next image I saw was of this like kind of like tribal warrior, also black woman and she looked really fierce and really powerful and really beautiful and it was like a message that only later on translated and it was like oh like feminine power is the message and like whatever that means but that was yeah it was sort of that's what I took from that and then I went and got my second cup and within like 10 or 15 minutes it's hard to know time because you start to lose time and then I was in a completely other world and it was like mind-blowing. Where did you go? I went into this place where I was seeing the most like crazy things. It was like I was seeing like almost what looked like neon lights but in like geometric shapes and in um, – I started to see what looked like these all these ancestral patterns. So it was like I was seeing indigenous patterns. So it was like a black background, but then these kind of bright and it wasn't like neon lights like the clubhouse sign over there, but in a I don't know, like something it was like light that was illuminated from the bl- like from the black background. Um and later on I went and like researched and discovered pictures and I was like, yeah, that's what I saw. So almost like there were pictures that represented accurately what you saw? It was pretty crazy to go – like I didn't see the exact thing but I saw some things I'm like, oh, that's in the same like similar vein to what I was seeing. Okay. And it just – like people that have had different psychedelic experiences have obviously tried to like draw things or paint things or oh, recreate. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the next kind of lot of messages – that came through and it's not all going to be in order now because now it's just a whole lot of different things in my mind. You mean, meaning you can't remember it in order? Yeah, I think it'll kind of jump around a little bit. Okay. Um, but, yeah, the visuals were like I was literally on another planet. Um, and I, I started to get, like, different kind of messages that come through and now I am actually going to try and go in order. So part of the start of it was there was like kind of fluid movements and there was like a female body and some of this is very like personal and vulnerable, but I'm going to share. And it, what it seemed like it was, it was showing like the feminine body and almost like celebrating the feminine and the message that I felt and got is like, I need to tap into my feminine because by nature, I, I probably tap into the masculine more. It's like the masculine is like, the doing and the achieving and the getting shit done and even the way I teach yoga is like strength-based yoga and running Mm. a business can be, not always, but it can be like that masculine and I'm just going to do, whereas the feminine is like the creativity and going through the, getting into like a flow and in movement that might look more like water and like fluid and sensual and all of that. But the way I tend to, gravitate towards is is doing is like from that more masculine place and so this message was like you need to be in flow and you need to tap into your creativity and you need to like embrace your body and the feminine and and it was really interesting because it was like really clear and really visual and it also like really made sense to me because like the way I was living my life in Melbourne was like all right, let's get this done and when am I running my next teacher training and run my business and just that's how I was doing things, which worked and I think I learned a lot. But then I've moved to Byron and it's like, all right, go and surf and be in nature and just sort of be in more of like a flow state at least from where I was. Um, and then the like the next lot of messages that came through and there was also music being played at this stage so by them yeah so they were singing they were playing instruments and someone had said to me like the music is really powerful and I like music but I was like okay like how powerful can the music be but you're in an altered state of consciousness and then one of the guys started singing and he actually had quite a feminine 
feminine qualities. Like he was quite like a gentle, soft kind of guy. I actually think the shaman who was a female was a bit more neutral. Like she had like the feminine and the masculine kind of qualities, but he actually probably presented more as like a, a feminine man and um and not how he dressed but just his nature he was like kind of soft and gentle and he started singing and the words that came out was sort of like about being whole and being loved and being you know you are like whole as you are and your heart like it was it might even sound like cheesy and corny now but it was all about just reminding you that you are you are loved you are lovable you are whole you're not broken you are complete and like to be kind to yourself essentially and it came out you know very poetically but it was like as soon as the music came on and those words were coming out I just started bawling my eyes out and it was just really clear it was a reminder of like oh you've been really hard on yourself and you've been like giving yourself a hard time and not seeing yourself as whole and complete and not loving yourself fully and um and then it was like, oh, of course. It was like a reminder. It's like something that I knew, but I wasn't consciously thinking I'm giving myself a hard time. It was more like, oh, actually, yeah, over time I have just, you know, if I didn't get this bit of work done, oh, like, come on, like, why didn't you get it done? You're procrastinating or you're wasting time or, you know, why did you sleep in that day? You should have been up and being more productive. And there's a balance between, like, discipline, but then also just – not acknowledging that maybe that sleep in was really good because then like you needed rest and so then you could be more productive later. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was like this reminder like, oh, yeah, you've been kind of just every day a little bit just like giving yourself a hard time. Um, and so it, like I teach yoga and I'm in the yoga world and there's a lot of talk about self-care and self-love and do all these things that are going to nurture yourself and love yourself. And I know it consciously, Mm. but this was like the first time I'm like, oh, this is like, I I actually felt it. It was like, oh, you need to love yourself more. And it's, it's in the way that you speak to yourself. It's in the way that you like, you know, if you want to go surfing in the middle of the day, go, go surfing in the middle of the day and don't make yourself bad, like feel bad for it. It was, it was a reminder of like, actually love yourself and let yourself do the things you want to and it's not to like lie on the beach and do nothing all the time sure if you want to do that for a period of time do it but to to actually like let yourself do what feels right rather than be like oh I should do this or I should do this or well you ate that piece of cake so now like you have to not eat you know x y and z Mm. So, yeah, it was like a felt, I was like, oh, I actually feel this. It's not just a conscious thought. That is a, yeah, there's so many strings to pull here that I want to pull. Um, it reminds me, it's like in this ever pursuit for constant progress, right, we can get stuck in a tunnel more more, better, faster, bigger, stronger, all of that. I particularly resonate with this, as you can imagine, and I'm yeah. sure you know you do yeah. to an extent as well. Yeah. It's like I have to remind myself, like life is this balance between doing what you want to do and doing what you know you need to do mm. to tap into your potential and help those around you. But I keep coming to this thing where I used to really criticize myself for – those things that you mentioned, the weak points. And I do recognize that they can be weak points. You can, cr- you can cave to a actual weakness in your character that you need to refine. Also, I think about, well, I've seen death and illness around me, my family, and I think that, that, and I, I think about death a lot and I think about life and I'm like, hmm, I want to do what I want to do. As like simple and strange as that is to say. Like totally I 100%. do what you want to do. Yeah. 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 But I don't know if you can resonate with this, but 
when I was in Melbourne, I thought I was living that life. So I was like, I teach yoga, I love it, I run my own business. Do you be emotional there? I can't tell. I, 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 I can just really resonate because okay. I know that like we have like sim- like probably a similar view and I think yeah. potentially you're even at an, another level than me uh, with this. I'm a crazy person. <laughs> I, 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 oh, people don't know. Uh, Go ahead. I, I do have an insight. Yeah. Um, and so I thought, I'm like, I am living this balanced life. I teach yoga. I love what I do so I don't feel like I work. But I also had a studio and I would happily work six days a week. And I wasn't working the whole time, but I had to make sure that things were running. I was teaching classes. I had to make sure that, like, the teachers were, you know, doing their part and and just do all the things about, like, making sure everything is running. And then planning my next teacher training on my next workshop and making sure I got back to that person's email or maybe I didn't. So then I felt bad about it and then I was like, oh, I should do that tomorrow or, or whatever. And at the time I was like, oh, well, there's people doing their corporate nine to five. That's not really nine to five. It's maybe like seven to eight or who knows what it is these days. And so I thought of myself as like, well, I don't do that. Like I don't do that kind of like job where I'm maybe don't love my job and I'm going to work and I come back and I feel really depleted. I'm doing something that I really love and I'm happy to work hard and it does fill me up. Mm. I think it was filling me up, but also I wasn't giving myself as much of that time to be like, oh, you can just like not do things or you can just go and surf for a couple of days. And <laughs> I, th- I think what moving has taught me, and I've, I've probably gone the other way, so I've kind of slowed down a lot to then find like a new middle ground and I'm kind of slowly like coming back to – Yep. The middle ground, I haven't like found it yet because life did just slow me down to, I think, teach me that. Um, but, yeah, moving has reminded me that I actually want to work smarter, not harder, so that I can like be surfing and I can have my teacher training running in the background because it's going to be like on demand and I will do some things in person and all of that. So I can still share what I'm passionate about, do what I love, help people, but I don't necessarily have to be like on demand personally the whole time because maybe that surfing fills up my cup so then I can go and inject more energy into people, into what I want to share and create as a yoga teacher, health practitioner and mm-hmm. and all of that. But it it wasn't until moving that I realized, oh, I was still part of that hustle right. and would feel bad if I, you know, if I didn't do this or I didn't do my workout or I didn't do my yoga or my handstand training or why haven't I scheduled that, you know, workshop yet or why haven't I um, done this teacher training yet or why haven't I done X, Y, and Z? And so, yeah, I think it's definitely – a balance of like, sure, there's going to be things where you have to like, and especially times where you might have that more intense time where you're like, all right, I'm going to like turn up the gear and I am going to work a bit harder and all of that. But then also to give yourself that time that even if you love what you do, but there's also all these other aspects of yourself. Yeah. Like I love yoga and teaching and all of that, but I also love surfing. I also like being out in nature and I also love like connecting with like-minded people doing different things. Mm -hmm. So it's like actually feed the other areas of your life. Did you feel like you were living a contradiction? I I don't think, I I don't know. It's hard to say. It's Is that what that, it sounded like that's what, maybe you wouldn't use that word, but perhaps it illuminated that experience, the ayahuasca experience, Mm -hmm. illuminated that you said consciously you knew that you needed to nurture these other sides to yourself but you weren't when you were in Melbourne yeah. and you moved away to Queensland, did this and you realized that? Maybe. I don't think I actually consciously knew when I was in Melbourne because I I thought I was living like, you know, when you love what you do, it's like you don't work a a day in your life kind Mm. of thing, but do you need to be working the whole time? Mm. And so for example, like when I was in Melbourne, I would go surf once a week. I would do, like my yoga or my my training, my handstand training, my strength training. And that was part of just, you know, looking after mind, body, health, all of that. But I I definitely was sort of more on with like my work and, and didn't have as much of the conscious times off 
of like going, okay, I'm going to put this over here because I'd, you know, answer emails weirdly at like 10 o'clock at night or I just, I'd work whenever it kind of fit in for me. I, d- I wasn't rigid with my structure, but I wasn't consciously taking that, like finding the balance, I think. So, but I, I didn't feel like I was stressed. I didn't feel like I was burning the candle at both ends until maybe the, the end because I was also You can move that. Thanks. <laughs> no, you can, like the whole thing. Oh, whoa. Like you can, okay. you can get crazy. All <laughs> right. Sorry. Um, I, I knew at the end I was feeling a little bit tired and fatigued, but I think a lot of that was emotional because of a relationship breakdown. Sure. I was working a little bit harder right at the end, but for the majority of time I thought I had like a good balance. I do what I love. I'm, you know, I'm sharing things I enjoy. I like the people that I hang out with. A lot of the people that I socialized with were the people that also came to yoga, but I would be teaching and then we'd have like a coffee after yoga and and that sort of thing. I was sort of, everything was wrapped up in a lot of my work, even though it didn't really feel like work. But I guess that the biggest thing is what I noticed when I left and when I moved is that I was like consciously taking that time to like it was nothing to do with yoga or work. I was having that like just checking out of those things and exploring other areas mm-hmm. of my life. It's fun. Yeah. To explore and pull on the other curiosities and the other things that yeah. make you you. Mm-hmm. Like you are not just a teacher. You are not just the thing you do. Yes. That, that essentially has been my big realisation. Oh, I could have just told you that. <laughs> <laughs> we could have just done this podcast a couple I, I months didn't ago. even need to do ayahuasca. <laughs> I am the ayahuasca. There was more to the ayahuasca. <laughs> of but, course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, that's, okay. Mm. Okay. So you, you mentioned earlier about your self-talk the, uh, the women with the slit throats, then the warrior woman, like these are symbols. Mm. Previously, when you were more critical of yourself, uh, what would what was this self-talk look like that warranted that type of imagery? So I don't even know if it's relate, like if those two... Not related? Yeah, I, and I don't know. This is like where it's like you do the ayahuasca and then there's like the integration time. Okay. And I'm, I'm in that phase of integration at the moment. And so I'm kind of putting pieces together. I, I think they're almost two different things. I think the images are a reminder to use my, my voice, my platform, my, my privilege as you know who I am in the world to maybe speak about certain things that maybe other people can't like what? and I and I'm still figuring this stuff out because I I don't know at this stage but maybe it's to share share my knowledge share information um and the, look the other part that I'm I'm starting to put the pieces together I also saw like yeah all this indigenous symbols pictures imagery come up and when there was like aztec symbols there was indigenous symbols and it was like all this stuff and every time it came up i just started crying and it was like oh wow this is it's so hard to even explain because none of it makes like conscious sense but it's like there was this ancestral trauma and it was like i was releasing some of the trauma Um, And so part of me after doing that, and it's been something that I've been thinking about for a while that I would like to in some way, shape or form, you know, help the Indigenous community in Australia and maybe that's what it is to empower, you know, Indigenous women or something. Um, And I haven't explored that further yet. Um, But I think that's part of the message is to help people that maybe are less um, fortunate than me um, in some way. Bringing movement, mindfulness, meditation, yoga to indigenous underprivileged communities, teaching them about themselves through that practice, that could be a thing. Mm. And it's interesting that like in the northern rivers where I live, you do see 
more awareness of Indigenous culture. Like in Melbourne, I feel like I never really saw anything around. And who knows if it was there beforehand or and I just didn't see it. I'm sure. not sure. Or was it not there? But I went for a walk in St Kilda the other day and I saw a sign that had some information about like the Indigenous culture and what land we were on and I was like I don't know whether that was there before but I've just noticed it now it may not have been there um but where I live in the northern rivers like there's so, like there's so much like awareness brought to the indigenous culture and I think living there is like a reminder that yeah I'm supposed to be in, involved in some way to give back to yeah people that have lost so much and yeah that they're now in an underprivileged situation and but there's there's so many people that could potentially uplift them and empower them um in different ways and you're still open to what exactly practically that could look like in the future yeah i I didn't reveal itself yeah i didn't necessarily get like a, a clear message and this is just based on how i feel it's like i feel called to be yeah connected to indigenous cultures and i've always like really resonated with like tribal things tribal music and um yeah and so i can just i it does feel like a right fit that i'm supposed to be in some way yeah helping the indigenous culture whether it's just here in australia or you know potentially elsewhere now to your knowledge you don't have any ethnicity or uh, th- through that lineage do not you? that i know of but i really feel called to do my ancestral 23 and me yeah yeah. Might be something there. Because I'm already Sri Lankan, Dutch, German, Maltese, Irish. Who knows what else? How the this hell is. are you all those things? <laughs> what are you, a toucan? It's a whole mix. Goodness me. That's so, cool. Yeah. So, um, so I'll never remember because you just said like five things and I already got, yeah. forgot like three of them. <laughs> yeah. So who knows? Like, um, okay. You saw these women. You saw these geometric, geometric these neon... I think I just imp- I just I've heard people see geometric shapes. You didn't you know, see I, that. I, I, it was like geometric shapes, but it was also like I saw almost like in an indigenous painting. It was like okay. flashed in these front patterns. of my eyes, or like these Aztec symbols. Okay, but it was kind of lit up with this black. Um, you had an background. emotional response to that. Mm. What else did you see and experience during and after? Um, I also saw a symbol of an eagle um, and. Then later on it was sort of like that my – something – it kind of came up as a message that there's something to do with my business. There's like an eagle symbol. And then later on when I looked up um, the symbol of an e- eagle, it's a lot about transformation and wisdom and new beginnings and, and all of that. I also got a message that I'm supposed to bring in some sort of vibrational medicine and I don't know what that is yet but I'm – I spoke to someone about it and they're like, oh, there's this tuning fork thing where you use um, this instrument on someone's like body, but it's like then puts vibrations through their body. And it's like, you know, we are energy, we are vibrations. And um, that maybe I'm supposed to be bringing that in as like some sort of modality into the other things that I do. Mm. Um, Okay. But yeah, I think that's something to experiment with. Yeah. Um, But I think like the, the big messages were about yeah being more in flow. The okay, other thing, feminine energy, yep. feminine energy, and another thing was also about joy and fun and pleasure. It was like you need to tap into that and not feel bad about it. It's like you need to like let yourself enjoy more fun and yeah. pleasure and and joy, and that needs to be a big part of your life. And it was interesting because I was already in that phase of like moving and stepping away from like I need to like do all of these things and actually maybe I can just enjoy life in a different way because it's not that I wasn't enjoying life before it was just had a different pace to it different feel to it it's tricky I find that tricky Mm. like to to deliberately allow yourself the space to do things that make you feel joy Mm. like a part of me it's like it's not that big a priority for me like I don't, I don't really want it, but shit, I know. In some ways, a part of me needs it. Mm. 
But damn, it, it really depends what mode I think you're in mentally. Mm. Whether you're in a building mode, whether like a, like you're building something, whether you're in a, a bridge mode between projects or tasks or endeavors, uh, whether you're in a reflection mode, like, like life is seasons. Mm. I think that's represented by you living in Melbourne, traveling away, going to Queensland. Northern New South Wales, but close. So, did I say Queensland earlier yeah. too? Northern I was like, New I'll South just Wales. leave it. Oh, like, no, nah. correct me. My bad. Yeah. The, the two rivers. Yeah. Northern New South Wales. Okay. Yeah, it's like, uh, I don't know. I just came off, I came off the back of listening to a podcast with Elon Musk. Mm. Right? So this is the, ex- yeah. you know, this is like, I listened, it was Lex Friedman. I don't know if you heard of him. He's, I think he's arguably the best podcaster out right now, and he will be one of the most popular. And he was interviewing Elon Musk for the third time. And he asked him, where Elon, where do you get your strength to like conquer the fear of these incredibly complex and um, intimidating tasks to colonize Mars and build a reusable rocket and and, and uh, these electronic vehicles that are so incredibly uh, complex and like, where do you get all this strength from? And he paused for a while. And he doesn't even think about it like that. Like he, did, he, did, he didn't even know how to answer the question. Mm. Like, where does he get this strength from? Like, he just, he just like he just said he just does it like he doesn't think about cynicism or optimism, like he just knows he has a task and project to do, and he does it. He almost sounded robotic in his answer. He sounded like a human machine robot, and I get inspired by that, and by people who just attack and they go. And I know a guy like Elon isn't really thinking about joy. He has a kid. Sure, he experiences joy through his child in some way. But after Orphic education is complete, I can't help but think there's something else. There's something bigger. There's something better. I know in me, and maybe if I did ayahuasca, I would maybe be illuminated even more to me. And I can't help but think if... You want to achieve and do those things that for a time being, I don't know if there's much space for joy and fun outside of the actual craft, the doing of the thing, which can give you joy and fun in some ways, but the the purpose isn't joy and fun. And so I teeter on this edge between just going and doing And what my relationship helps me see is a reflection of that, okay, I can experience joy and it's okay to, and you're giving yourself permission to. So I I flip back and forth. I don't have like a, sometimes I just, you want to do so much and you know you have, like you would waste your life if you didn't actualize the potential that you have inside of you. Like, I feel like I would regret and maybe you would regret if you didn't like pull that string that was like really tugging on your brain and heart. And I don't, I don't know how joy sometimes fits in there when the ultimate mission is just to keep going and keep doing no matter what. Mm. I, I definitely hear all of that and there was a time in my life and it wasn't that long ago where I felt like I know what I want and I'm going after it and it was so clear and it was so like these are the things I want to do and then I end up doing a lot of them and it was weird I like you know one of my big goals was to run an international yoga teacher training and I and I did that and then COVID and all the things happened and so that changed my trajectory of like, you know, I wanted to travel and run, you know, international teacher trainings and and all of that. And when I moved, it kind of gave me an opportunity to kind of like slow down and take stock and it's been a little bit uncomfortable as much as it's been amazing because I do 
feel like I have a goal and a mission and I do want to live to my fullest potential and I do mm-hmm. want to have an impact and I do want to share and I do, you know, want to have a, an empire of my own in some way, shape or form. And so to go from someone who felt like, okay, I can see it all, like I, I, I know exactly where I'm going and then things took a bit of a turn and I kind of embraced that but then I moved and I was like, oh, I actually need to like slow down and reset and even just mostly reset with myself. Mm. Like, and so it's been a big, like, personal journey. And I think there was a time there that I was, like, trying to push, like, okay, I've got to, like, get my online business happening more. And what I was doing is, like, I was kind of trying to do it and I was trying to force myself to do it and feeling bad when I didn't do it. And I actually had to just go, like, all right, like, just use this time as, like, reflection time. This is your time to, like reassess where are you going and go and enjoy the surfing and go and enjoy you know this part of your life and I had a conversation with someone and he's like this might just be a short period of time so like use this time now that's true where there isn't a particular thing that like has to be done at this moment he's like this time you may never have to just like be free and like go and do all the things true if you do because I know that I I have a big mission and I right. want to, I right. want to do it uh-huh. like, cause that's still like, it's like slowly bubbling up again, ready to like go. But I think it's actually been really important to like, let's just fill up my cup in all the different ways. Okay. Um, and I totally resonate with you, but I have, I, I didn't really embrace that until I actually did the filling up of my cup and like just reassess like me and like, and all things related to me because then how I am with myself is then going to translate to how I share and how I show up as a teacher, a leader, or whatever in the world. Um, So I think it's been really powerful. It was definitely a bit uncomfortable because I was like, I'm not putting things out there and I'm not achieving Mm. things and I'm not, what am I, like, you know, I was still doing little bits of teaching and sharing but not to the level that I'd previously done. You have so, space. Yeah. So I was battling with it for a bit because I was like, this is un- this is new, this is unfamiliar, and it's all not super clear, um, but it's now given me time to go, like, how do I actually want to move forward rather than just always, like, going, trying to go forward, but actually go, like, this is time to, like, slow down, reassess, reset, like you said, the seasons. Yeah. So this has been, like, the reflection and the filling up my cup to then like go, all right, this is like a new lifestyle. Like I live in a new place. I have a new lifestyle. I now want to take that new into a new vision and like move forward because like if I was just like, okay, take Melbourne, this is what I was doing in Melbourne and just go, all right. But like a lot of things have changed personally and because as you know, as like a teacher, a coach, like you share what you're doing for yourself. You share what's helped you, what you've learned and what you value so it's like I need to take that and now continue the sharing, but it looks a little different. Yeah, comes in a different form. Mm. And realize that we're actually in a pretty similar space mm-hmm. because after selling Orphic, I have been in this space mm. where it's given me the opportunity to have space, experience, like what your friend said. I think that's like a very good point. You may not get this time again in a long time because you might get then addicted to something else and you just get obsessed with the next thing. This is a period of time, absolutely. It's not going to last f- maybe long or forever, of course. So this is a time to have more dynamic flexibility, to go with the flow of the day, of the week, of the current time, of the season, experience more, more joy more of what you want to do or more of where your curiosity chases you. Uh, yeah, pulls you. Hmm. That's definitely where I feel, I resonate. I feel, mm. I feel like I'm in a similar position because dozens of hours of time. And it's interesting. It's not just the time you put towards projects. I didn't realize how much mental space it took up. Mm. Like you're planning, you're thinking, you're pondering. Late at night when you wake up. Yeah, because even just thinking about like, oh, what's the next thing I'm doing? Or what's like, where is this business going? Or what am I putting my energy into? Even if it's not like the physically showing up in the gym or showing up in the office, like it's it's your baby. You're always Mm -hmm. like 
building it here before yeah. it comes out. That's great. That's great. Yeah, we're always building it mentally before it actually yeah. physically. And when you take away something, when you remove something, it could be a relationship, it could be a business, it could be a friend, a family. When you remove something, it leaves space for other things. As I, I, it, to me, it's akin to a death, a death of sorts. Mm. And what comes after death? Rebirth. That's right. I think that needs a sound effect. Oh, which one? <laughs> Whichever one. Go oh. for it. Bang. I get it. I get it. I get money. 50 Cent. Shout out to 50 Cent. 50, if you're listening, um, I have a podcast available uh, slot next week for you to come on. Curtis, just in case. Um, so, yeah, space, joy. Hmm. That's what it's, and you got to sit with it. You got to sit with the discomfort. Yeah, yeah, and that's not always comfortable. Mm. Mm. What else is there? Anything else from this experience that you wanted to mention that you realized or saw or experienced? Um, it was interesting because a lot of people had said to me, like ayahuasca can be really hard. It can be really challenging. It can be really confronting. Um, but also I had heard that it can be really amazing and really beautiful and all of that. And I left that experience going, I I thought like ayahuasca was like a one-time thing. You go to ayahuasca, you get all these messages, cool. Now I'm going to bring that into my life and, and you're good. And for some people it could be that. I had an experience that was actually, even though there was some dark things that I shared before, but it was you know, there was the stuff about joy and pleasure and femininity and flow. And even though I was crying that I wasn't loving myself more, it was like, it was like a reminder and it wasn't bad. It was actually like a nice message. And, you know, there was the ancestral trauma stuff and that was sad, but it was also like this, like uh, maybe a reminder to be connected to indigenous cultures. So I left there feeling like I've been gifted this like beautiful experience and it's shown me several different things and that this was actually just the start. So the interesting thing walking away was like, oh, wow, I've got like I have saw a lot and I, I learned a lot is that I need to give myself time to integrate. So it's been three months and I feel like there's little things that like I'll listen to a podcast and it would mention something and it happened the other day and I was like, oh, that's what that meant. Like I'm, it's weird, like the integration is has been really cool like different things are popping up at different stages and it's kind of letting things land like the feminine power message I got like I didn't really know what that you know that female character of like a you know strong fierce woman was about because it's you know it doesn't come with like a this is what this means and then I picked up this book and the book was called fuck like a goddess but it was like... It's a strong title. It is a strong title, which could be polarizing for people. And initially I was like, I don't know, do I want this book? Do and I want to fuck like a goddess? Let me <laughs> think about that. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. You can't go back once you go there. That's right. Like Only well, a certain type of men can handle that. <laughs> exactly, which that, that, that cuts down the men to very few. <laughs> <laughs> very few. Like Zeus, Thor, <laughs> um, Superman. That's all I want. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> But then at the bottom of this book title, it was like, tap into your feminine power. And I was like, oh, that's what this message was. It was about feminine power. It's like, yes, I can, you know, run my business and I can do all of these things, but it doesn't need to be from a masculine, like, Mm. just go and do. But it can be from like this feminine and creativity and go in it, like, be more fluid with it. Um, And yeah, it was like, it was when I saw that book that, It was like, oh, and it's weird. Like a lot of those things are happening, like things I saw. I'm like, oh, that's what that was. So a lot of people have talked about the integration period that you need to let these things sink in and then you need to think about how you're going to action these things. But um, it's interesting then going through it yourself and actually feeling different messages land at different stages. Um, So ultimately I feel like I'm going to, go through and do ayahuasca at least a few more times Mm -hmm. because I think it peels back layers. And, um, yeah, I found it a really powerful experience, but it's certainly been like a, yeah, like a personal journey. It's like 
how do you unlock these things within yourself so that you can keep showing up as the best version of yourself. Um, and I think previously I always wanted to show up as the best version of myself, but it was maybe from a different um, aspect. It was less of like, I don't know, can I love myself more and can I treat myself more and can I like really like tune in and listen in to what is really right? And I thought I was, um, but now it's just kind of sh- like highlighting things in a different way. You speak about feminine energy, mm. like, like a goddess. What does it mean to be a woman? What is a woman to you? I guess that's a really big question. And I think part of what I'm learning is it's like for, and I can, I guess I can only just speak for myself. Like I grew up as someone who didn't necessarily speak my opinions and it's still a work in progress. It's like, I would happily sit on the fence and I didn't want to be involved in anything that was confronting or confrontational is probably the word. So I I had parents that used to fight and so I saw them like fighting when we were younger and that was not, not something that you want to see. And so then I've grown up and not wanted to like say the wrong thing because I didn't want that to be something that turned into a fight, whether it was in a relationship or with um, in friendship. So I would happily be Switzerland and sit on the fence and just, I'm, you know, I'm easygoing, I'll go with the flow, as in like I won't have my opinion or I won't share what I really think or feel or I won't have that uncomfortable conversation. And I think this is a big thing for women is where we're kind of like, Um, and I was listening to a podcast and I was kind of talking about these things that like, oh, like that message of like, oh, yeah, like I I don't mind, like you decide or I'm easy, like, you know, whatever you want to do, like rather than being like, oh, this is what I want and this is what I'm doing because then you can be seen as the person that, I don't know, is too upfront or too opinionated or all of those things that like a lot of women might hold back what they're thinking and feeling because they're just, you know, they want to not disrupt anything. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think for me what I'm realising is that like when you don't say what you want and what you feel and what you think and what you need and what you value, then you have to sit in this place where you're like, oh, well, I don't like this. This doesn't feel good, whether it is in a a friendship or a relationship or a business or – For example, like I had staff members and there was a few staff members I had when I had my studio that just didn't really align with my values. But I was like, they're they're my staff members. And do I just, you know, like keep them on as my staff members because it's probably easier just to like, you know, there's a few things we don't align with or do I have the uncomfortable conversations and let them go because that no longer aligns with me? you know, I'm not a man and I don't know this, but it seems like guys can like have an uncomfortable conversation and like move on a little quicker. Do you know why this is? No, share. There's... Be careful about this. (laughs) I know, it's it's all sensitive topics. The words are important. Words are very important. And you want to think about things before you speak about them. I was thinking of, I was pausing on it. It seems time now. Well, roles between males and females appear to be quite clearly defined through thousands and thousands of years before the last, you know, one, two hundred years. You know, let's, I'll use the analogy of the hunter gatherer. You know, men would do hunting typically, women would do gathering, nurturing, uh, very important roles. In both sides, just to paint a simple picture to begin with. And then in the last one, two hundred years, particularly last 50 years, we've seen this revolution of sorts, this this, this big change and shift in individualism where through the Western world where the individual can do and be essentially whatever they want. You know, freedom. We've never been technically more free. And so... 
that has its beautiful components to it. But what we quickly forget is that this monkey machinery, this chimp mind of ours, has been adapted to millions of years of evolution, particularly through those behaviors all the way from chimps to bipedal hominids and so on and so forth to we are here today. And so when we talk about what, you know, women typically being more submissive, maybe, mm. some people would say. Male, you gave the example of like, oh, I wonder how this would be for a male to just, you know, like fire my employees, right? There's something called the big five personality traits. Have you, have you heard of them? Mm. Great. So then you you would already, you kind of know the answer already. Uh, Jordan, Peterson has been, Jordan Peterson has been very famous for making, popularizing this, but they're like fundamental psychological uh, traits of all human beings. One is agreeableness and disagreeableness. And on average, we see that women tend to be more agreeable than men on average. There are men and women on the entire scale. You can have very disagreeable women and very agreeable women. However, on average, agreeableness is a trait that skews higher, measurably, like decently, for women than men. Therefore, it makes logical sense if you did your big five test and you saw where you sit, you might be, I don't know, in the 70th percentile of agreeableness, right? Uh, I did this. Yeah, I'd recommend doing it if you're in a relationship because you can start to see and problem solve where you may work well or not work well together. And so to me, part of that answer is simply character and personality and where you sit on that spectrum. And that's to me, that's okay. I don't think just because societal standards and norms are changing means you have to become that. You can do and be whatever you want, but you can also allow yourself to align with perhaps the natural tendencies and uh, values and personality traits and even traditions over thousands of years that have gone on. I think that's okay. And I'll leave it there. I'll get off the little pedestal. Okay. All I'm going to say about that is, is it things that, is that the case because it's conditioned? Like, is that what we've been conditioned to just agree and like, okay, yes, that's okay. Um, or is that like an innate, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, is it like a Genetic? primal oh. um, response? Like, is that like naturally innate how we are or is this like societal conditioning that that's how women have become and you don't have to necessarily answer it but that's a good question to, like, i think some maybe if we had an evolutionary biologist in here they could allude to that but i'm sure uh it's good to be able to argue both sides if we could entertain both sides on one side there has been well like is like the woman has been the housewife, the man has been the worker, right? Traditionally, like stereotype on average, right? Particularly like in the early 1900s during war times, like that was like, you see like classic newspapers and photos and things like that um, and advertisements. It's very interesting to see. And so that would have been enforced and encouraged and just continually done, you know, kings and queens during, you know, during... Roman empires during, man, you can keep going. That's still potentially like, like conditioning. conditioned. Yeah. But then where does that begin? I don't know. So that's why I use the word like innate or primal, like back before all of those things, like in a hunter gatherer kind of setting, you know, was the female still that agreeable female? Oh, like or, from chimpanzees? Well, yeah, possibly. Or like, a, so when we look at, like when we look at, um, uh, so there's differences, bonobos, uh, females, uh, it's swapped. Females are the dominant ones, males are submissive, right? <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's serious. So great. 
it's, it's the opposite, right? So ladies, you, you can be a bonobo, right? And, and like bonobos, females, dominant, male submissive, um, women, uh, they're one of the only uh, species to have um, bisexual relations. So they will, the females will have intercourse with the females and then the males will, they'll, they'll get involved as well. But the males have been often observed just observing from afar, like being quite submissive in that aspect. Chimpanzees, on the other hand, which we have a closer lineage to, flipped. Uh, males being very territorial, very aggressive, um, where the opposite sex dynamics are present. And so, it, but then it's like, why did that happen? Because that's observed through just behavior of animals. You know, you can watch David Attenborough mm-hmm. documentary. You can you can read about chimpanzees, and you can see these tendencies between species. So, it was called talking chimps, right? It's yeah. called talking so chimps for a reason. <laughs> because what is it? We share about ninety eight percent of of um, DNA with chimps as humans. Okay. I wanted to remind us that guys, we're like. It's been a long time since we were chimps. But we're still pretty much but chimps. Like we're pretty primal. Like, we're pretty, <laughs> like if we take it, strip it all away, all yeah. of this fancy stuff, mm. and we just had to survive, we all just enter gangs and tribes and just defend our territory and survive. And so to me, you take it all the way back to chimps, where we evolved from, and then society creates customs and cultures and norms around these tendencies that enforce it. But in the last 50 years, change, big change. It's like, what is a woman? What is a man? What are our roles? So a lot of stuff that I've listened to that kind of takes a little bit of the masculine or like looks at the man and woman, but then kind of goes actually rather than looking at like a man and a woman, like Mm -hmm. look at the qualities of the masculine and and the feminine. And, and this sort of helped me understand maybe how it works in a relationship or even just the dynamics just between people is like the masculine is by nature, like more there to be like the grounding and the the protector and to be really like present and a, another masculine quality which also helped me really understand men is they they want like stillness and nothingness and that's also why they the whole like man cave thing is because they they can which is kind of what we're sitting in yeah so we're, we're in the masculine man <laughs> cave but is they they like to be in that like the the stillness, the quiet time, the, yeah, like to have that like space and time is like a very masculine trait and quality. So they say even meditation could be considered more of like, uh, like tapping into more of the masculine because it is about like stillness and quietness and being in your own, your own man cave, I guess. Hmm. Um, Whereas the feminine is about creative, creativity and Low and even emotion and passion and almost if you were to think about it as like movement that feminine is more like this and the masculine is more like this like we're you know like solid and grounded and like the structure and but isn't that beautiful yeah because so they complement each other to- so beautifully totally so it's like let the woman be free right? and feminine and a bit crazy and uh-huh. like they talk about women being crazy but it is actually like to be in your feminine is to let your emotions like ride your emotions ride the waves and mm-hmm. and that's also where like people's creativity comes out is through like feminine energy and sexual energy is like that's the feminine and whereas the masculine is that yeah, the more grounded, the more like structure, solid, present, all of that. Um, and so even when you asked about like what is being a woman, mm-hmm. like almost now I relate it to like the masculine and feminine qualities. And like technically we both have masculine and feminine qualities. Yes. But if I was to be in, more in my masculine, which is what I was, like more in my masculine – then I'm not tapping into that sort of like the femininity and creativity and being in flow and kind of letting my emotions like come out in different ways. Um, and so then that's going to impact 
like my different relationships and whatever they look like and vice versa like a, a man that's more in his feminine is not going to have those maybe be as grounded and be as present and and all of that and you know by nature we might be more feminine or more masculine whether we're you know a man or a woman um but yeah for me i've been called to like tap it more right. into because you've spent that. a lot of time in more of that masculine dominant yeah and so maybe space. it's to find balance or maybe it's to be more right yeah more in the feminine and, and, and to, like to me like that's fine that's okay so like I I, 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 to, I celebrate that in, in, in many ways. Uh, I don't know. It just, I don't care. There's no judgment. I don't care what people do. Right? I really don't. But to me, like that feels like instinctually, like naturally, I'm going to be careful about that word because nothing is natural. Anything that's possible is natural. Um, as Yuval Noah Harari, have you read the book Sapiens? No, it's on my list. And I Did we talk about that last time? Possibly. Girl, it's been uh, seven months. <laughs> I, I have, I'll be doing ayahuasca. <laughs> Give me a break. I have I'll an, be tripping. I have an audible collection <laughs> that like is this big, and then I've also got the physical books that I'm reading. And okay. Anyway, well, if you prefer, I'm just actually about to release a book summaries on Sapiens. I'm doing each chapter because it's a very, very profound book to me, and that's where they talk about a lot of this stuff as well. Not so much masculine and femininity, but evolution. Mm. Um, and so, uh, to me, that one's pretty difficult to rebut because well depends how far back you go but the um the observation at least currently that we can do of chimpanzees is very interesting and from a behavioral perspective it's like oh we evolved from them cool could explain some stuff now some stuff um so instinctually if 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 one is to uh, agree or, or observe and see that lineage and see the commonalities it makes sense why maybe you would integrate back into more of that feminine um, energy or virtues versus just constantly living potentially in in the masculine because it's uh, it's sexy it's gonna get you money. I don't know. It both can get you money. I don't know. It's just it's sexy. It's like it's where this world is. Work hard, hustle, get your money. Mm-hmm. You don't need no man type thing, right? Like exactly. that's sexy. But is that really what you want? Is that and if it is cool, but ask yourself that? Or are we just tricking ourselves as well? Mm. So yeah. These are my thoughts. Totally. I thought I I didn't even really resonate with being in my masculine as as maybe as much as I was until I moved. And again, it was just like reminders of like, yeah, less about hustle and being like this and to be more in flow. And, and maybe for me, it's about going into the feminine more to then find balance where I can sure. have both. I can have this. Yeah. This I've balance. Yeah. And, you know, you know, guys that are really in their masculine probably also need to, like, tap into their feminine sure. and tap into their ability to, like, you know, talk about their emotions and feel different things and get into flow, but, but also, you know, know how to come back to their masculine. And right. Mm. Mm-hmm. When you messaged me and you said you had some things on your mind, some lessons, mm. Were there any other lessons in the last seven months that were profound to you? I think there were the, the key things about, yeah, the, the lifestyle that I was living was when I shifted it, yeah, it presented as like, oh, actually I was living like this and, and now kind of getting into more of like a flow was about really about giving myself rest that I thought I was having um, and so that was like, you know, one of the big lessons in ayahuasca. And I think the other thing was just that reminder, which I've seen in many different, you know, times in my life when I was in Melbourne, when I had a studio and even like how I met you is when you're aligned with yourself, when you're doing what aligns with you, whatever that is, you meet your people. 
Um, and so since moving, I, you know, teach yoga in Lennox. I surf in Byron Bay and, you know, I have housemates where I live. But I've since moving have met so many like-minded people. And again, it's like I'm, you know, I've shifted my lifestyle, you know, still doing some similar things that I was doing in, in Melbourne, but it looks a little different. And then when you are living in alignment with yourself, you meet people that are in the same place. So I've only been there seven months, but I've met lots of, you know, really great people, made great friends. And I look around and I'm like, oh, these people are kind of very similar to me. Um, And it's a nice reminder of like when you are living in alignment, it's like then you attract similar people. You become Um, them in a lot of ways too. You assimilate their values and their tendencies. Yeah. So you got to be very careful about who you surround yourself with. Totally. Um, And I, you know, I remember seeing that in Melbourne a lot when I had my studio and I could tell Mm -hmm. as soon as someone walked in the door whether they were going to like like my style of yoga or be a, you know, a good fit for the studio. And nine times out of ten, it was like the people that were walking in already were like the, I would say the right fit or they, they aligned Um, because even just to walk into my studio, I didn't have great signage. You had to have like heard about me from someone or some like a a referral from someone like, oh yeah, go to the studio down the street. Like the classes are really great. Like it wasn't necessarily put in people's, um, Mm. in people's faces, but a lot of people that came through the door became some of my best friends. Um, Because it was like I, at that time, I was living in a line with my, alignment with myself and you know then things shift and then I moved and things changed but it was like everyone that came in felt like a reflection of me at that time I hear this and it's like surround yourself with like-minded people right it makes you feel good so it feels like you're on the right path you 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 have a tribe you have like a community a tribe right but I'm the butt guy right the devil's advocate guy I'm like I think it's why this is good podcast is because you can you can conversate and you can find ideas that uh, are conflicting or where you there's friction, which is good. And so I'm just if we because I agree with it, like surround yourself with like minded people. If we keep doing that, how do we know when we're wrong? So I'm going to go back a little bit. Like what I feel like is it, it's not necessarily. It's almost like for me, it feels like like attracts like. And so it's like certain people come into your life at certain times because it's like you're vibrating on a similar level. You have similar values. And so these people come into your life at a certain period of time. It doesn't mean they'll always stay in your life. And I'm certainly realizing some of those things, you know, over this last year. Sure. Um, and so there are the people that will stay because you have similar values and you can grow and keep learning and, and you evolve. Like I'm a different person to, I was seven months ago, 12 months ago. I'm sure you're a different person now than you were earlier this year or last year. Um, and so like, we're always evolving and we're always growing. And so I think you meet people where you're at and my biggest learnings have been in relationships. It's like, you know, with my ex it's like we met each other where we're at and like there's a reason it didn't last because we evolved and went in different directions um and so i think if you look at probably your friends or the people that you value in your life it's probably because they have similar values and but they might not have been in your life five years ago and they might not be in your life five years for now or maybe they they will be um but at least what I've experienced is that these people are kind of organically showing up. It's not like I'm trying to like surround myself with people that are like-minded. Mm. It's like, you know, I've met people through yoga or through surfing or through, or through friends and it's, it's happening organically and you turn around and you're like, Oh, these people are living a very similar life. So then we can support each other. We can inspire each other. You can, you know, help each other like at the stage that you're at because you're on the same page. doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just where you're at at this time and I think you're always evolving in some way. Mm. 
Okay. I like what you said when you don't necessarily intentionally try and even find those people. They just like come into your life. Like kind of how we met. Yeah. I mean, you, you intended for someone to come in there. I didn't know who it was going right? to be. Right. You know, we'd end up being here so many years later. What's something you used to, th- speaking of wrong, what's something you used to th- really think, really believe was correct and the truth that you later learned you were wrong about? I don't know whether it's wrong, but my dad used to say to me, you know, you need to work smarter, not harder. And I think I've already mentioned it. You you did, know, yeah, very briefly, yeah. but let's go. Um, because I resonated with like, I love what I do, so I don't work. Like I would always say like, I don't really have a job because like I teach yoga and I get to hang out with people that I genuinely want to hang out with. Mm. I get to share some things that I'm really passionate about that I'll equally and i do this all the time we'll chat to a random person and help them with that without getting any money or anything like you know i had met someone surfing and she was talking about her sore wrist and i've had a similar thing and so i you know gave her some advice i had a similar chat at a cafe and so i would happily talk about this stuff anyway i don't need to get paid for it and so i always good because i'm not paying you for this podcast (laughs) great i don't want your money (laughs) said he was gonna pay <laughs> <laughs> I lied. <laughs> That's what I do with all my guests. Just the high profile ones he pays for. <laughs> That's why I get fifty cent on next week. Hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Woo. Um and so I always like was like, well I don't work. I do what I love. I get to share what I um what I love and I'm like I'm happy to work hard. Like there'd be times where I was running a teacher training that I'd be teaching from like, you know, eight in the morning till 6 p.m. at night. And I'm like, cool, like I do what I love. This is great. I'm happy to do this all day. Um, But I didn't value like stop because I was always like a yes person, like, oh, you know, someone's sick. Can you cover that class? Yes, I can cover that class. Or do you want to come and run a workshop here next weekend? Yes, I can do that because like I love what I do, all of that. Um, and now I'm like, actually, I can still do what I love, but I can also do it in a smarter way. Like you don't have to be on like 24 seven and not that I was on 24 seven, but you don't have to be on all of the time to still be successful, whatever successful is to still be productive, to still have an impact, to live a really comfortable life, to feel like you're adding value. And so now I want to embrace that. Like, let's learn from people that have done this in a smarter way. What's ways that I can still like tick the boxes of like, am I having an impact? Am I getting to share what I love? Am I, you know, making a positive change in people's lives? Am I, you know, feeling like I've got a purpose? And can I do all of that, but do it in a way that it that is smarter? I don't need to like, like hustle as much all the time. And for sometimes not too much reward, sometimes there was more reward, but can I do it in a smarter way so that I can explore all those areas of my life that I want to explore? What's more important, working harder or working smarter? Right at this moment, working smarter. And in general, Uh, for human species? As in, like, for everyone? Am I speaking for everyone? Yes, you are king, (laughs) queen, god. What's that book called? So if we look at the world, a lot of people are stressed, they're tired, they're run down, they're fatigued, they have all these health problems and a lot of people are grinding, they're working really hard. I think if people worked smarter, Mm -hmm. then I think people would be happier, they would be healthier and there would be less chaos in the world. Like... People don't even stop to have a conversation with someone. People barely look up at you if you cross them in the street and look up and smile. People like barely like you could be talking to someone and they can barely even give you eye contact because of the stress and anxiety that's going on for them with whatever they're dealing with. I'm really interested in people who can't maintain eye contact. I've noticed I know of people who I won't mention where some they'll have such aggressive 
um, I, Elliot Hulse calls neurotic holding patterns, like these holding patterns from maybe past trauma or, or a lot of shame. I, I think what I've heard and read is that um, not maintaining eye gaze has to potentially do with a lot of self shame and judgment, mm. which is quite interesting. Like, where does that come from? Um, I think trauma is like often used, like some people see, can see this word as some like hippie word. It's very strange to me to even to, to think like that because it's, you know, it's pain, it's suffering. Like trauma is, you know, we've all, most people have a version of it. It just reveals itself differently. My point is eye contact, eye gaze. I know one person who it's like they're looking at you but they're not, their eye gaze is down and constantly blinking rapidly, constantly blinking rapidly, like trying to, you know, if, if you're watching on camera, you can kind of see what I'm doing, like like trying to, you know, look up, but never, you can never really see their pupils. Um, and I'm like, huh, what happened there? Mm. You're not born like that. Well, unless you have some type of neurological condition. What happened there? Have you ever seen people like that? I think I know what you're talking about and I, I feel like what, I associate that with it seems like a nervousness mm. um, and what I've just because I love human psychology and like body language and all of that so what I've noticed in what I've observed since coming back to Melbourne is people are really struggling to like have a conversation and just have eye contact and it's normal for you to like look up or like sometimes when you're thinking that like, I think it's even like, I forget which side yeah I forget yeah it's because one side is like if you're tapping into information, the other side's lying. Very good. Yeah, but I, I never remember which ones. To my recollection, top left is the remembering thought. Okay, yeah. Remembering memory. Yeah. Go on so, there. Yeah. So I've noticed that people's are, like their eyes are darting everywhere and I'm uh, part of me is like, okay, like what is that? Is it... What's is, wrong with you? No, no, but not even like that, but like kind of like at a deeper level, like what, mm. what's going on for people? Sure. Is it because they struggle with like having a, a conversation and is it a confidence thing? Is it a, a focus thing? Or everyone's been in lockdowns and yeah. so they've been in this little bubble and then they now are outside and I was, you know, in Melbourne the other night and there was people everywhere. It was like... Crazy, like it had that you know buzz of Melbourne, but it's also a lot for people's senses. So, is it that their mind is like it's all like is it overwhelm, or is it a confidence thing, or is it a stress thing, or right. is it an anxiety thing? I I'm not not sure exactly, but it's something that I've noticed, and I'm like, yeah, is it because of what everyone's been through? Is it their own personal stuff? Well, particularly now in the last six to twelve months, like I, I, that that adds a huge. Mm, that context is very important. It probably mm. muddles up like what it actually is. Mm. But yeah, I've heard that from clients of mine. I've heard that from, I see that. I felt a version of it myself, which is quite strange. I'm like, huh, don't usually feel this. Mm. Interesting. Mm. And then more exposure, just like anything, it goes away. Mm. Uh, usually. But uh, to backtrack, your dad works smart. Is that the thing you used to kind of be on this work hard principle now you're learning work smart what's something i'm very interested in this and it's something i've resonated with over the last couple of years with how do we develop really smart systems within business within personal life to to delegate and eliminate like you are thinking about in your life what can you delegate and eliminate that you don't need anymore so what have you thought about that for you working smart what is working smarter in your life now look like and what does it look like in an ideal world money doesn't money's not a question mm. and so this is a transition for me so it's certainly like I haven't got it all figured out because it's now about the implementation part of it so I would say it's definitely a work in progress and it's going to be a change from what I was doing because before it was like work harder and that's what you do you just work harder and you do I did a lot of things myself. I definitely got some help from people and people like you that were really helpful. And But I definitely struggled to seek out getting help from people, so the, the delegation part. Because, you know, as a small business owner, when you don't always have, like, big amounts of money coming in, it sort of can feel challenging to go, I'm going to outsource this and pay for someone. But it is that balance of, like, okay, maybe 
you pay someone to do that, but then you have that time which could be better used elsewhere. Um, so for me at this stage, it's like, all right, can I invest in some more of the delegation? So, you know, get people to do the things that I'm not very good at or that I'm not very efficient at. And all of it really is like the tech side of things for me. Videographer, editing. Yeah. So I've got like the equipment to do the video, like the videography, but then the editing and the uploading and scheduling, yep, distribution. Yeah, yeah. Got it. And all of that because sure I can do some basic editing, but the time it would take me to do that would be I'd be better off like churning out more content and like filming and, and doing all of that. Because I've got, you know, the setup and I can do that. But doing the editing and doing like the fine tuning and all of that my my brain gets a little more frazzled doing that and it actually takes me more energy yeah. whereas I could like teach three yoga classes in the time that I could probably edit one video well then to me that's how you rationalize and justify it like in that time you're saving you then go okay I'm gonna use that time to to make money and help people elsewhere mm. and you also got essentially you have to bite a bullet and you realize you're investing in future Amelia mm. you are taking a short-term hit so you can have a long-term greater return on investment. So then that short-term hit pays you back in dividends. By That's what I'm doing now. And by investing in that person, paying them a retainer, I don't know what, uh, one, two, three hundred dollars a week, you now solve a really important problem that doesn't pay you back now because we want that instant gratification, mm -hmm. right? You want the sugar hit now. Yeah. And you're gonna have to wait. We're yeah. gonna have to wait yeah. because Oh man, it's happening to me right now. I, on YouTube, I some I love books. I summarize these books. One is called The 48 Laws of Power. I had no idea. 40 what? The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. It's a very popular book, New York Times bestseller, but everyone's got a New York Times bestseller now. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, very profound book on human behavior, understanding the dynamics of... Um, it's very interesting because it tells uh, how people behave through history, uh, through lessons, stories, fables, through history, and certain laws and principles that we're all uh, capable of doing so you don't get caught out and be manipulated by the people. You understand the game of life, if you will. Point is, summarize that book because I loved it. It really was profound to me, really taught me a lot. And I spent, hundreds, I don't know, hundreds of hours doing it. And I put it out there and I have like almost no one following me and I do it. And eventually that series, not now, but in, I did that in 2015. Oh, wow. Right? I was a kid. <laughs> and you should see the types of things people be commenting and how profound they found my interpretation and what I did here. I don't really, I feel like a robot sometimes. It doesn't really hit me. So I don't really, yeah, I just, I thank them if I can see it and if I have time. But anyway, later, these videos have amassed hundreds of thousands of views, right? Never had any intention. And like most are, are nearly that or coming towards that. And every now and again, they'll just, one will pop up and I'll just be like, it's like 2021, 2020, 2019, 2018, like years and years later, had no intention of doing that. Had, and other book summaries and other videos have done that. Even on um, the, the other media company, we did Jungle Beats Media, where we reviewed music. Like, same thing. Like, there'll be this, these ones that just pop, right? And guess what? That doesn't just get you influence and leverage. It, it makes you money. So I had no intention of making thousands of dollars from videos, but it happened. Later. Mm. On the back end. You have to be patient. Years later. Yeah. That's crazy. It is crazy. 2015. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. So six, seven years I've been doing that. And then eventually, oh, you know, who knows what will happen in the future. But if I end up getting you into a position where that keeps going and exponential growth begins and we're sitting here and this maybe is much more popular, I don't know, don't care. Try not to think about it. But if it is, they'll call you an overnight success and they'll go miss that. Mm. They're going to miss 
all the stuff that came before it, it's going to look like an overnight success. It was really a tipping point. Mm. So that delegation and investment priceless could have some pretty valuable equity and return mm. on the back end next year, yeah, next month. And I think that's the, the biggest reminder for myself is, yeah, it's like what you said before, invest in future Amelia and – and just remember that, like, your time is so valuable and, like, what would take me five hours might take someone five minutes and they can churn through that, that stuff so quickly. Do you have an out? You do. Maybe you don't want to say it. It doesn't matter if you do or don't. You have an hourly rate that you charge. Yeah. Right? Do the math. Yeah. Yeah. Is that time you spent editing worth what you could make or how much you just value your own time? Yeah. Yeah. And, and also like doing something le- like the tech side of it, like the editing is going to make almost like take my energy. Whereas yes. teaching gives me energy. Go. So then I could do twice as much of that three times, four times the amount of that and like finish my day and feel like good. Whereas like sitting and doing the editing stuff, I'd probably feel like, okay, all right, I got through one video or whatever. And it's endless too. Because yeah. you'll keep creating content. Yeah. Because that's the game. Yeah. So. So I need to find a new editor. <laughs> there's a lot out there. But yeah. you know it, that's a problem you need to solve. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Is there anything else on your mind? Is there anything, anything else on my mind? That you've been ruminating on or realizing or that you wanted to talk about? I don't know. I think I shared definitely some things, like some big things that were there. Um, I wanted to ask, did you do any, before you did ayahuasca, was that your first experience with drugs or did you do other substances beforehand as a gateway to get you there? Because that's that's a curiosity of mine that, hmm, if someone wanted to go there, should they go there first? Would you recommend other compounds hmm. first? Great question and this is like would be the first time I'm saying this in a public setting and I've already talked about ayahuasca so I'm happy to like elaborate Mm. so a lot of people had said to me like you know ayahuasca is like this it's big it's it's full on it's you know like it's not a a walk in the park and it's not something you should go in too lightly um so you want to be in the right like mindset and the right you know state of body and mind to to jump into this but also part of that for people could be you know trying some other things that aren't as big as ayahuasca so it could be to take mushrooms and in that kind of ceremonial way, not in like a party drug way, but like, you know, mushrooms can, you know, take people on a journey that can bring up things, you know, from their past or help them process things that they've been through. Or for some people it's creativity or it can, you know, be different for different people. And some people also said maybe LSD could be something or, you know, so I did get told to maybe work up to it. The person that I am was like, look, I, I really want to do ayahuasca. It was something that, like, I was drawn to because of the things I'd heard, because of the transformation it had pe- in people's lives. And I – so I kind of, like, <laughs> bypassed those things and went straight for – Straight to go. Yeah. Do not yeah. – collect on dollars. Yeah. Okay, good to know. I'm not to say – that's not to say that's the way to do it. That's your way. Yeah. So. Okay, interesting. Good to know. Are you afraid of death? I would say I would have been more so. Now, I don't know. I think ayahuasca definitely has had something to do with it. Um, or dying, I think, is more of a tangible word because death, you don't. You don't, no one knows what it is to die because you're dead. Yeah. But we see people who are dying. Mm. Do you think about that? Um, maybe a little bit. And I think this is part of like my, like my own personal goal and mission is to be the healthiest version of myself and to be someone that like does like to, you know, and I'm not certainly not perfect, but to treat my body more like a temple is because I do – I want to like live out my years in that 
the healthiest, most um, productive, youthful way as I can. So I want to be doing handstands when I'm 90. I don't want to be in a, in, in a wheelchair. I don't want to be like hobbling around in, in pain. And, and, you know, certain things happen to certain people and, and that's life. But part of my goals is to like, is to continue to look after my body and to continue to be as, you know, as healthy as I can so that I, I do get to, to live my life. And, you know, who knows what happens, you know, whenever it does, but I would love to be in the best shape for as long as I can so that I don't like one thing that I, I really struggle with is when people, even my age, I'm 36 when they're like, Oh, well I'm getting older. And so that's why my back hurts or I'm getting, I know I can see your eyes twitching. Oh, like, you can see what, that. What the oh, that was pretty good. I tried to keep it together. <laughs> nah, you're good. Uh, yeah. Damn. <laughs> you're you like, see my what, brain ticking what, over. Yeah, I know. It's I can, ready to punch him in square in the face. Yeah. And so like already I hear it at, and I'm 36 and people are like, oh, well, you know, I wake up and I'm a bit stiffer and tighter and sure, like you age and things evolve and your lifestyle hopefully evolves with it and, and all of that. But I, I already hear that from people I consider young. Like I, I'm 36, I feel 26, I, I, f- I feel young. And then, okay, then you add in another like 10 or 20 years and then you speak to other people like, oh, well, like I can't do that now and I can't do this now and, you know, I love my mum but there's certainly things that she can't do now because of, you know, where her state of health is and I don't, I don't want to put myself in that like situation because – why would I want to take away things from my life? Why would I want to take away the ability to surf? Or I had a 70-year-old lady in my yoga class the other day and I did what I think a lot of people do. I did judge her and I feel bad for it. So what I said to her was when she came into my class, I, I knew what I was planning on doing and it was, you know, and Amelia, let's get a little bit crazy in our yoga class. Nice. And I said, you know, feel free to skip as much of it as you like and, you know, you can rest, you can modify. You Individually can, told her. Yeah. yeah okay. um, because I hadn't met this lady before. It was one of the ladies' mums. She brought her into class and, you know, I saw that she was an older woman. She looked like a fit older woman, but she, she was like, you know, I'm 70 something and, you know, I've done yoga before. Um, but I, I, I really wanted to let her know that don't feel pressure to do everything we're going to do because we're about to get into inversions and get upside down. I was just about to start teaching and I saw her in an L sit and I was like, Amelia. What, prepping? She was doing an L sit for, as like a warm up. She, yeah, she was just there doing an L sit and I was like, don't judge a book by its cover. You don't know what people are capable of. Yeah, it's true. And give them the opportunity. And obviously, I was just letting her know, like, essentially, do what you want to do, which is like, you know, a nice part of yoga. It's like, you don't have to do any yeah. of this, it's up to you. You take your own journey. But I had in my head thought, she's 70-something. She's probably not going to be able to do this. I'm about to teach pincher, a forearm balance, and that might not be appropriate for her. But as soon as I saw her do an l sit, I was like, she's all good. <laughs> and I even said that to her. I was like, oh, you'll be fine. <laughs> and she was. And That's great. she came up to me at the end and thanked me and she said, that was a, an amazing class. And it's also like once I saw that, I was like, oh, I'm not going to hold back with her. I'm going to give her the opportunity to explore. And she was upside down like everyone else. Beautiful. Um, Just shows you what, what we are capable of. Yeah. And, you know, every decision we make is either an investment in our future self or a liability mm. for our future self. Mm. And so, unfortunately, those people, you know, bad things happen, like bad luck for some people, absolutely genetics, whatever. But outside of that, like some people just make really shitty investments in themselves mm. and they don't think about, you know, that's, you know how like you see a 50 year old person or 80 year old person, that's probably going to be you, but we don't identify. We don't, a lot of people can't see themselves and identify as a future self, mm. right? It's a thing I think. Psychologists talk about maybe Kelly McGonigal um, that how well can you identify with a future version of yourself and that how well you can will actually be a predisposition for do you make disciplined long-term decisions or do you cave more to the craving in the moment? Mm. 
And I find that very interesting because the 40-year-old version is you too, but we just don't really connect with it. Yeah, we can't see ourselves in those shoes yet. And those who do a better job of seeing that future version of themselves generally make better long-term decisions than those who don't. It's like, I don't know if you've seen the image, um, and maybe because it's in the yoga world, maybe you haven't or maybe you have, but there's this image floating around on the internet of this older woman, maybe she's in her 80s, 90s, who knows, and she's got her leg up a pole. So it looks like she's doing like splits up, like up a pole. Um, But it's like that image of like, yes, she's older and you wouldn't expect to see that. I think she's in like some like fluoro, like track pant kind of um, outfit. But I see that and I I see myself in that. And like I want to be that older woman who's being a bit weird on the street with her leg up the pole like she's doing the splits. And that, yeah, like she's older but she's not letting like her age get in the way of like doing whatever she wants to do. And a lot of that is dependent on your actions way before that. Mm. Every day. Mm. What are you doing consistently? Your habits. Yeah. Speaking of old people or elderly people, what do you think to finish off? It's a hard one to really conceptualize, but what do you think that version, that 70-year-old, 60-year-old version of yourself, you're going to reach that age most likely, what does she tell you if she's here? You go on a trip and then you can speak to her. So she's telling me this now? She's telling you this now. She's coming to you from the future through an ayahuasca trip. <laughs> what is she telling you? She's telling me to not get in my own way. Get out of get out of your way. So like if I'm holding myself back and I've been playing with this just in my head, just in this last few days of like, if I didn't care what someone would think, what would I do? Like if I was not worried about the repercussion, what would I do? If I was not worried about looking silly, what would I do? Like get out of your own way. And what would you do if you weren't in your own way? You were just doing exactly what you want. And I played with this just yesterday in like just a really small way. And it was like, I'd just been to the Elwood outdoor training area and I was wearing like leggings and a crop top and like, you know, everyone's there. It was hot. Like you kind of like take off some layers, but my normal self or like the self that I would usually be would be like, you know, make sure you like you put your top back on if you're going to go down the street and like go into a shop or whatever. But I consciously said to myself, if I didn't really give a shit about what anyone thought, would I put my top back on or is it, it's hot? Like, can't I just wear what I'm wearing and that's totally fine? So I went, all right, I'm not going to put my top back on because I am hot right now. I've just been out in the sun for two hours and training and I want to go get a smoothie. And so I'm just going to wear my crop top and my leggings and I don't need to put my T-shirt or my singlet back on. Mm. Um, and that's just a really small example because it could be so much bigger and so much more profound than that. I think that is profound but because that's how you that, – it's an expression of how you do anything. Yeah, it's like just those little actions. Yeah. If, those, if you could get out of your way and all the little actions, that would probably lead to other things. I like that. I think it's a good place to finish. So thank you, 70-year-old Amelia. I'll take that's that. That's a good tip, 70-year-old Amelia. You're a very wise woman. <laughs> uh, Any last thoughts? Thank you for sending me a message because I really love – the the sporadicness that then also yeah like works out as like this beautiful timing right so thank you you're welcome I'm glad we can do this again yeah. and we'll do it again yeah. and again until you're seventy great <laughs> <laughs> done um, if people want to see this thirty seven year old version of Emil yes thirty six thirty six sorry <laughs> sorry they want to see this version and want to see more, where do you point them? Um, social media is probably the easiest way. So Instagram, access yoga underscore, things are going to change a little bit, but for now, who knows when this will be released. But if you look up access, you'll A-X-I-S. We're going beyond yoga. 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is originally you talked about to me a couple of years ago. Yeah. Originally it was starting like just access or all these branches, I think. Yeah. You can call it access. Call yeah. It. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's funny how sometimes things take a little while to actually turn into the physical, but um, yeah, I just think it feels very fitting right now to be, go beyond yoga. Good. There's more to life. Yeah. Much, much more as you're expanding and we're finding out. Totally. Yeah. All right. Um, Facebook, same same thing, access yoga, but it may end up just being access. Watch out, chimps. <laughs> Watch out. She's coming. <laughs> See Peace ya. out. <laughs>